Kristen. 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 Daddy's home. Kristen. Kristen. Hi, Kristen. Where's mommy, Kristen? Where's mommy? Hi, Kristen. Kristen. Hello, Kristen. My thought, please, Kristen, please respond to your name. Hi, Kristen. I hoped that Kristen would respond in some way, but, you know, when she didn't even, like, flinch, I thought, oh, God, this is serious. Hello, Kristen. Boy, just when it started to get so loud where my ears were just, just vibrating, you know, like a jet was coming through this room, you know, I just felt sick to my stomach. Just like, oh God, you know, this, something's wrong. What we had worried about became reality right then. It was confirmed. So she wasn't responding to loud sounds today at all. And these sounds are very loud. And these are the different frequencies here. And this would indicate that she has a very severe hearing loss. Or when I saw the little line on the chart, I thought, well, okay, where's normal, though? And then when you see that normal is at the very top of the chart, then you go, oh, wow, you know. It looked pretty bad, especially when most of it was at the very bottom of the chart. And then when you have it explained to you, well, what exactly does that mean? You know, what, what, what is it 110 decibels? Well, it means that, you know, perhaps she can hear jet airplanes or something like that. I, I don't know how to describe the physical feeling, but <laughs> just like having something just drained out of you, just like I'm going to pass out and I, maybe I wish I would, just wreck. Well, I was totally aware of all the sounds around me at that time. So I was just totally in tune to the sound and wondered, oh, come on, she's got to be able to hear something. You search out every possible reaction. Just look. Her pediatrician came in that morning. She was perfect. Remember how I, I was almost afraid to hold her? Oh, she was so little. <sighs> Boy, I love you, Daddy. Have I? Have I won your heart? No. Had she? Yeah. And everybody that knew we were taking her in for testing, <laughs> just telling them about it, you know, well, this is it, and trying to be somewhat scientific and technical. That That's kind of the way I block sometimes. Um, emotion is I try to look at everything real scientific and analytical and, you know, use all the big words that have been shared with me and, and um, you know, people don't know what to say. Nobody could make it better, that's for sure. And then her second birthday party. Not only was it her second birthday, but it was a month out after she got out of the hospital, man. We were gone all out because, man, our kid had knocked this terrible disease and she was going to be okay. It was just a Saturday before the party was that um, a pediatrician confirmed the fact that she apparently was not hearing. You had this this hope that maybe it was just going to be, you know, like big clog of wax in her ear or something like that that the pediatrician couldn't happen to see the day before. But um, on the other hand, what we'd read is that meningitis tends to cause, you know, permanent hearing loss. I felt kind of cheated. Yeah. I, well, I'm sure that that hit me. I, I, I'm sure that the first thing it was, it was cheating. You know, it was cheating me, it was cheating her. Just, you know, why? I mean, 
you know, why did this have to yeah. happen? I mean, you she know, was. It should have happened to me. You know, it should never happen to her. She never did know. anything to hurt anybody. Even now, I'll think, God, I wonder what Crystal and I would be talking about if, if she, you know, I wonder what <laughs> I we'd be talking about. I hate to think what you two would be talking about. If, if she still, you know, had her hearing and consequently her speech. I, I do think about birthday. that. I, I try not to dwell on it, but I, I would say a day doesn't go by that I, I don't think about it for a minute. You know, I wake up in the morning and go, oh, yeah, I don't have to deal with this today. So, yeah, I, I feel a little bit cheated. But, you know, yeah. I, I know what John's saying, too, that we have all these hopes and dreams and everything. And she's the same child, but something that was there before is not there now. And communication skills... Are, are a real difficult thing not not to have. So, I don't know. I mean, I hate to have her be blind or, or, or anything, but yeah. at least she could talk about it. I couldn't find any answer as to why it should happen to us. They're just, they're just, I don't think there could have been a good answer that would have explained or made me feel better as to why Todd was deaf. I was just mad, angry, bitter. Uh, I felt if there's a God, why would God let this happen to us? Or anybody? Um, it becomes a very deep question. It was, a, it was a real shock, and at first you didn't want to accept it. Uh, a little bit of anger, a little bit of, you know, a great deal of frustration as to why, why me, why him? You know, why in the world would it happen to him? three-year-old kid who's never done anything to anybody, why in the world him? And that eats at you for a while. And uh, then it takes faith to, under to try and understand that there's a reason for whatever happened. And then as you analyze his personality, he's a, if anybody had to be picked to have a handicap, he's the type of personality that could handle it. That took a long time to get to where I could say that, though. I mean, initially, I couldn't even talk about it. One of the hardest things I had to do was uh, fill out a form that uh, at work for the insurance for the whole meningitis episode in the hospital that you check handicap. And uh, I've been very athletic and, you know, and, uh, and love music, and here I'm checking that my son is deaf and handicapped, and that was really tough, because at that time he also had a very bad balance problem. And we didn't, at that time we were guessing, well, I, I don't know if he, he'll never hear music, and I also, I don't know if he'll ever play ball, and I don't know if he'll ever, and those are the silly things. Those are the things I thought about right away. Often what happens when parents hear that their children are deaf, they go through a series of responses that are rather predictable, but everybody responds differently. And if one family responds in a certain way, it doesn't mean that the next family will respond in, a certain, in the same way. And within a family, a husband may feel one way and a wife may not feel that way yet or at all. And typically what happens is that people might go into a stage of what's like n mourning. I remember you always saying that it wasn't sad. You didn't think it was sad? No, I got very sad that Jacob was deaf. When did I say that? I was like crying constantly. I was very confused and you said it's not sad. When you find out your child's sure. deaf, what can you do? You can explore all the medical sure. options. And then when you realize what the circumstances, you have to start to live with those conditions. And the more quickly you do it, the better off the kid is. It doesn't mean you don't get emotional, but it means that you've got to proceed smoothly with, with your kid and then let the emotions fall in where they might. They may sense that they have to be a teacher, but they don't know what to teach. They've heard lots of terms that are totally unfamiliar. They may be totally angry. Why is this happening to me? And angry also that the child that they had wanted and the child they felt they had now is a different child and what happened to that other child you can ride on that wheel? Ah. one of the things that was hard was marry women cry men generally don't and i don't i think it's important because i i, I can share this with other men i think that they'll probably know what i'm saying and finally she just kind of got on my case and just said, hey, don't you feel any of this? You know, why aren't you breaking down like I am? Why aren't you crying like I am? And I just said, hey, look, I'm grieving in my own way, and I have to grieve the way I can handle it and the way I can get it out. Crying doesn't do it for me. It did at the beginning. I cried, and, but 
over and over and over again, it just doesn't do anything for me. It doesn't help me any. It just, it, if anything, it, it hinders me. I was trying my best to be strong. I was trying to be the rock for my family. And that was, many people said that. I don't know what it was. If I, if I could take it, if I could handle it, the family would make it. And that was a lot of pressure on me. Mom. I never realized what not hearing was. I always thought of a deaf person as just somebody who couldn't hear. I didn't think about not being able to communicate. I always thought people were born deaf. I didn't think they became deaf. I, I never thought about it much. I guess because I never was in contact with anyone who was deaf or so hard of hearing that their communication was a problem. Tracy. And uh, when Tracy, Tracy's communication with me was totally and instantaneously cut off, I, I felt it uh, very deeply because that's, that's the core of your relationship with your children. When you really get down and think about communication, it's not just hi, goodbye, and telling jokes and uh, talking on the phone. It's feelings. And Tracy and I could not share our feelings. She couldn't share her feelings with me. Can you give me the pink Open his mouth. Sorry. I mean, I was devastated in the beginning. I felt like I wanted to dig a hole. I wanted to jump in. I wanted to pull my whole family in, and that was it. I wanted to close out the world. I didn't want to be hurt anymore. I just couldn't believe that we could have gone through the sickness, which was horrendous. Then, initially being told the only thing wrong with him was that he was deaf, we were relieved. We were actually grateful. And then after a little while, when we started realizing what deafness was, we were still grateful he was alive. We were grateful he didn't have brain damage. We were grateful for a lot of things, but at the same time, you know, darn, this happened to our kid. This isn't fair. You know, it's not, I mean, it was really, really hard. Okay, here we go. I'm gonna put hook you up for sound. Come on. When I first heard that Kristen might be deaf or had that feeling, it went flashed through my mind. The only thing I knew about deafness was uh, I remember in the Midwest where I grew up people carrying cards around and about the hand signs and it kind of put a scare to me uh, I didn't know how to take it realizing then I know more about blindness than I do deafness and I and upon talking to a lot of people I gather most of us are that way and then you get into you know hearing aids maybe hearing aids will just correct it like that just plug them in you know tune it up and you find out that's not the case very quickly. You know, there's a lot more to that because what frequency does she hear at? And like in terms of speech, she may hear real low frequency sounds, not high frequency sounds, which most speeches okay. are in your high frequency sounds. Can you hear now? Can you hear now? We still don't know what she can hear, what she can't hear. Uh, Hearing aid-wise, we're not even sure that they're helping her any. So uh, it's kind of a hard thing to take. Well, we're not going to go down to the park. Not right now. We'll go to the park later. Let's play keep away from that. I thought it mostly in terms of just uh, communicating with people more than anything else. Because Krista had always been and continues to be quite an extrovert, you know likes to be around people, a real social type being. So the fact that she would miss out on that or, you know, we would have to, of course, deal with, you know, well, what area of communication are we going to work with her on? 
that's what hit me first. And then, of course, the other stuff, you know, just, boy, sound is just a part of our environment. And, and this, you know, sound is a part of our safety mechanism. You know, you worry about that a lot. You know, how will my little girl ride a bike? You know, will I ever feel comfortable letting her do that when she can't hear a car honk at her or somebody yell at her to stop or anything like that? No, Ellen, you can't have it. So, you know, I knew, hey, this is going to change our life. I think if you don't allow yourself to feel what you feel, you can get stuck in a place that is a guilt place, and you just feel guilty for the rest of your life. And you may look at your child and always feel sorry for him or her, and you become overprotective, perhaps. You might want to just forget everything about your relationship with your child, the whole child, and just focus on the deafness. And one may never feel comfortable developing a relationship with a whole child. It's important to merge the, the deafness with the wholeness of the child. And without going through the stages, it's impossible to look at the child as a whole child because you get stuck with the deafness. Walk the talk. With, with Ryan and Rory, they're so different in personality. And there's a lot of things that Rory does that <clears throat> initially we would blame on the deafness. And then we started finding out, and the more therapies that you go to and talk, and the more you talk with other parents, you find out that a lot of things that deaf children do, children do, and it's not the deafness, it's the three-year-oldness or the personality traits. I mean, my children are very different, but I think of Rory before he lost his hearing, I think of Rory as I carried him, you know, when, when I was pregnant with him, he was, he had the personality traits he has now, hearing or deaf, and he's a difficult child. <laughs> you know, he's just real what? I think it'll help him eventually. If we make it, he'll make it. It's, it's, it's kind of different having a deaf brother than when he could hear um, and he could talk better and I could understand him better. But I still do understand him pretty well. But it still is pretty hard even for me. Okay, get out. His attitude towards his grandparents hasn't really changed. Uh, he's not being able to hear him, you know, hasn't changed his attitude or his love or anything. I mean, you can see that, that that's not changed. I think that's important for people to know that if that relationship is a good one, then it's going to stay a good one. I don't, I don't necessarily think that that, that changes if the, if the love is there. Yeah, there's times where I can't understand what Rory says, and as long as Mary's there or somebody I can yell out to, then, then it's okay. But if I'm alone with him, which I've been, I make the best of it. I, we work it out. Um, and he gets a little frustrated probably at times, but the love is there so that it all kind of, it works together. I think yeah. the whole secret is the love. That she, and it's, this is not an acting love. This is truly within myself. I, I adore him. The most important thing that a parent can do for their child is to stay involved with that child, to become involved in every aspect of the education and the um, treatment for the child. The most important thing that they can do on a continuous basis is to establish some means of communication so that they are communicating that will keep the frustration from building up and it will make that family unit uh, cohesive as a unit so that they can communicate with all members of the family. She became very visual very quickly, and with the type of program that we're in, uh, with heavy emphasis on the auditory training aspect of it, there's some habits that we fell into very quickly that we're trying to break. It's frustrating, what can I say? It's terribly frustrating. You think, I want this child to have every opportunity to be an oral child, but yet she sometimes communicates with me and John with gestures, you know, come here with the hands and all gone and 
you know, brush my teeth, kind of her own communication system. I remember the first time I saw like a deaf kid, I was shocked at how he looked just like, he looked like a regular kid, you know. And I think part of the fear is you don't know how regular and, and normal these people are, you know, emotionally and, and in terms of love and just caring. I remember once taking him to see a parade when I can't remember how old he was and being very moved by the fact that, uh, you know, gee, he would never be able to hear these marching bands, and I really love marching bands in a parade. He, however, had a great time at the parade. And uh, so it's hard to know. Uh, I think the worst thing about deafness is you're not sure what it means, and then you take so much for granted with a child that they're going to be normal and they're going to speak and hear and walk and talk correctly and everything else you figure the problems will come from the other stuff and here the basic problem is just in communication and you lose sight of how normal a deaf kid is and I think that's the terror when you first find out your child is deaf that he's not going to be normal but you know they like ice cream they play with you they tease you but Megan did a wonderful thing she went out and just started meeting a lot of deaf adults so that we had a model of what our child could be that was a successful deaf adult. All the advice I was getting about raising my deaf son was coming from hearing people. So I wanted some first-hand information, and I decided to go meet some deaf adults. And I met deaf students and deaf artists, deaf professionals, and it was wonderful. It was great. It was uh, very reassuring and took away the panic. And I realized that deafness doesn't have to prohibit having a healthy, happy life. It's important to meet models, other people who have hearing losses, deaf adults. See that they're successful. One of the most common fears of parents is what will happen to my child when my child grows up? Will she marry? Will she be able to go to college? Will he get a job? People ask all these kinds of questions, and they're very natural. So try to get yourself into a situation where you can meet people who are deaf, who have successful positions, who, who are living as happy, functioning human beings who love life. That's the best antidote, I think, for feeling so much despair. Nancy's chances of having a deaf child are the same as anybody else's. If the child was deaf, or we knew it was going to be deaf, I, I think we would still have a child. I mean, why not? <laughs> that, to me, wouldn't be a factor in not having a child. Especially with a mother like her. Hi, is Anya? No, he just left for lunch. Whenever somebody is saying something, if I cannot read the lips on a one-to-one -one basis, Leah will mouth all the words that are being said by that particular person or a person in the room. <laughs> yeah, I'll bet he did. I think my mother probably worked more with me as a child in terms of speech training and so forth. I think where my father comes to play is expressing confidence in my ability to do things. I really am under the impression that there's no, what I could call, deaf world or hearing world. There is a world out there on what we make of it. That means that I think each child, their hard of hearing, is going to really develop their own world. The parents are going to be very instrumental in helping them to develop a world that may be more open and less isolated by becoming part of the world the way they do with their hearing kids. Where there's a lot of people, she'll tend to stand back and observe it a little bit more before she gets into it. Because it's, you know, it would, it would look absolutely chaotic, all these people jumping around and yet no sound coming out of them. Just kind of taking it in, you know. With Kristen, she seems uh, she seems to have adapted to it pretty well. I've had people tell me that it 
her young age, perhaps she doesn't even perceive exactly what, what has happened, you know. Before he was born, I had other plans for him, <laughs> you know. I have to give up on that. Uh, now we're adjusted. We, it's our life. And we don't think about what it would have been if he were different. We've learned what kind of guts Tracy has. And it's, it's in ways been beneficial to our family because we do realize how hard it is for Tracy to be deaf. But we also realize how much more you can do than you normally would do when you have a barrier put in front of you. A glance of intricate harmony. Here we go. We sit in silence as we wonder. And there's an awful lot of happiness out there to be had. And we're finding it. It works out the way it's supposed to. They've sent men to the moon. They've sent objects out in space that are still sending us back information. And from her ear into her brain is rather short distance. And I don't see why they don't spend the money on that. And sometimes when I, you get a bunch of children together like this, that I want to uh, grab somebody off the street and bring them back here and just say, tell me which children are deaf. You know, show me the deaf children. You know, what's different? You know, what's different about a child? And well, that's the truth. <laughs> there is no difference. I think it's the same expectations you have for a hearing child that they not join a cult. <laughs> they don't become drug addicts. When well, you're positive, Just they the, earn a living, they leave the house when they're yeah, 18. Yeah. Get out of your hair. <laughs> Nobody can guarantee that your child's going to talk. Nobody can guarantee that that they're going to be able to go to your neighborhood school. They can't guarantee that they're going to be able to learn as much as they want to, because it affects their learning so much too. Um, you think about all these things and and we came up with two or three things that we thought Tracy would be able to do uh, we don't feel that way now because um, Tracy's teaching us again <laughs> she's teaching us that she can do darn near anything she wants to do and as long as we don't say oh don't even try it it's impossible if we just sit back and watch her she'll do things that we don't think she can do